So I'd actually like to begin um, by inviting you, if you're willing, and if you're not, that's fine too, inviting you to join me in a, a very simple and small movement just where you are. And this movement is, from, is to a very old and probably very familiar to you hymn called Spirit of the Living God. Remember that one? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. That one? Okay, so for Spirit of the living God, we just take our hands and we lift them to God as if to receive the Spirit from God, and then we just drop it over our body. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Then we do it again. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And then the words are, melt me, mold me. So you just think of melting and molding wherever you are, whether you're standing or seated. I'm standing, you're seated. So just melt me, mold me. And then when the words say, fill me, you straighten up with a nice big breath and then use me. Here I am, Lord. I'm ready. I'm your servant. Pretty cool, right? This was choreographed by my old friend Margaret Taylor Dome a lot of decades ago. And it's been taught to hundreds, I would say thousands and thousands of people. So if you would join me, let's just sing a cappella, unless you want to help us. Here we go. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. good kids. <laughs> it's not true that Presbyterians are the frozen chosen. <laughs> I didn't ever believe that anyway. <laughs> when I was a young school girl in about the fourth and fifth grade, I was a dropped off and picked up kid at church on Sunday mornings. Um, I loved being there. I believe it was a Disciples of Christ parish, actually, very close theologically to the UCC, my ordaining denomination, and Presbyterians. I loved going there because the church lovingly embraced me. They encouraged me and affirmed my presence and participation in worship. I was invited to sing with the adult choir which was awesome, and I really enjoyed that. But my favorite form of participation in those days was being part of the children's movement choir. Now, <clears throat> we are talking late 40s, early 50s, quite a while ago. We wore little white robes, we children, and we stood together, five or six of us in the chancel, and we moved in unison to a song sung by the choir. <clears throat> Our movements were not complicated or difficult, but somehow for me, there was a spiritual worship among the community, a spiritual connection that I got in touch with when moving with this little group. I called it prayer in motion. And we children put our very best into our simple movements with all the devotion and sincerity that we could muster, much as we imagine David did so very long ago. Martha Graham, <clears throat> the great pioneer of modern dance in America once said, dance 
is the hidden language of the soul. Ponder that. Ponder that as we consider today's text. Now, this is a very dense text. There is a lot going on in this text, and I suspect that you could have a whole sermon series on this text. There's just so much in here, and we're not going to talk about all of it because we don't have time. <clears throat> but at this moment in time, Israel, uh, in Israel, things are really going along pretty well. There's a new king acknowledged by the people as God's choice to lead God's chosen people. And it's a time of peace, finally. David, the new king, has conquered Jerusalem and has made it as the new capital city of all of Israel, renaming it the city of David. A little arrogant, but oh well. <clears throat> He's built a splendid new palace. He's added wives. They did that in that patriarchal time. And even more children, of course. And he has recently prevailed over Israel's perennial enemies, the Philistines, not once, but twice. Now he just needs to get the Ark of God into Jerusalem so that Jerusalem becomes not only the political, but also the religious center of Israel. That Ark was the centerpiece of Israel's religion the most visible symbol of the presence of God among God's people. The place where the Lord Almighty is enthroned between the cherubim that are on top of the ark. Very special. King David knew the old tradition about the ark. He knew that he had to bring the ark into his city because then that city and his kingship would visibly become the city and kingship of God. Subtle, but powerful. As one caller, scholar put it, when David brings the ark to Jerusalem, he literally brings God into the center of his kingship. Now, whatever we think of King David with all his weaknesses, if we know his story well, and imperfections, and he has plenty. He is remembered as a man after God's own heart. When he celebrates with his people, dancing full out with all of his heart and all of his strength, having stripped off his fancy kingly robes and wearing only the priestly ephod, a kind of uh, uh, undergarment, Think of a, a short shift that a woman would wear. It's kind of like that. Came down to, you know, about the hip or just below the hip. So kind of like that is what he was wearing. For David, this is a humbling before God. This is a sincere dance of devotion and love to God. To my way of thinking, picturing David is the exact opposite of that image that appeared before us four years ago when we all saw former President Trump standing in front of a church that he rarely attended and waving a Bible. What connection was he making, was he trying to make? And did it work? Maybe for many people, but not for a lot of people. Alan Levinitz reacted this way to the event in his article, and I quote, America opposes idolatry. Not just the act of idolatry, but the very idea that idols have power. This is why its laws, unlike those of many other nations, do not criminalize the burning of holy books or the destruction of sacred images. Its citizens do not worship pictures of leaders. 
The power of words and images in the United States is in the values they represent, not the objects themselves. Even the perpetual attempts to criminalize flag burning consistently, and perhaps rightly, always fail. Just as destroying these objects has no magic power, neither does holding them up. Only idolaters believe that waving a flag makes you a patriot. Or wearing a cross makes you a Christian. As the singer John Prine put it, your flag decal won't get you into heaven. But back to dancing. Research shows that for the first five centuries after Jesus, the church vigorously opposed any dancing in worship. For Tertullian, Augustine, and others of their ilk, dance incited idolatry, lust, and damnation. Nevertheless, despite centuries of dance, prohibitions that came from church councils, ancient and medieval Christians would simply not stop dancing. 13th century friar Francis of Assisi was said to dance in a dramatic fashion when he was preaching. Did you know that? I didn't, and I just discovered it and I would have loved to have been there to see him. Then the Protestant Reformation came along and put the kibosh on dancing in church again. And while the PBS documentary series, The Black Church, this is our story, this is our song, and the scholar who put it on, Henry Louis Gates Jr., reminds us that African Americans introduced new rhythms, music, and dance to Christianity from the days of slavery up until the present time. By the 1930s, white Christian worship in this country remained stuck in a more puritanical view of dance in worship. No dancing allowed. The very word dance was a red flag. I first became aware of this red flag when I met Margaret Taylor Doan, the woman I mentioned at the very beginning of our time here. I met her in the early 80s in Fresno when she started attending the First Congregational Church where I worked as Director of Christian Education. By the time she arrived, I had already started uh, sacred and liturgical dance ministry. It was intergenerational in nature and very active in worship with the support and encouragement of the resident pastor, Frank Baldwin. One day, after she'd been worshiping with us for a while, Margaret came to meet me and to fill me in a little bit on her journey. It turns out that she was one of four women who had been identified as the great foremothers of sacred and liturgical dance in the United States. She'd begun her life work as a pastor's wife in a UCC church in the East. Margaret worked with the children, preparing, a little, uh, preparing the little angels to do some simple movements during the annual Christmas play. Innocent, yeah. Well, when word got out of what she was up to, it hit the fan. The church fathers called her right onto the carpet. She was the pastor's wife, but she told me she was a bit scared when she went to that meeting. At the end of their meeting, however, given Margaret's passion and love of Jesus, she used to say all the time when she was teaching, that's my Jesus. I just love that about her. She was so connected. At any rate, at the end of their meeting, because of her passion and love of Jesus, not to mention her rather disarming personality, 
those church fathers could only say to her, oh, Margaret, you can do anything you want. Just don't call it dance. <laughs> Margaret went on to practice, practice the art of sacred and liturgical dance for the next 60 years giving countless classes, workshops, TV shows, and writing no less than nine books on the subject. She was the very first American to start writing about sacred and liturgical dance and the history of it. She was a founding member of the National Sacred Dance Guild and served that group for decades in leadership. My dear friend Margaret passed into her eternity at the age of 93, shortly after completing her last book, which was entitled, Dancing Nine to 90. She was as passionate about dance as devotion to God to the very end. She and David had more than dancing for God in common, I think. Something Joseph Campbell, writing on the power of myth, once said, and this is going to be familiar to uh, many of you, if not most. Campbell said, people say that what we're all seeking is meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive. So that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonances with our own innermost being and reality. So that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. David danced before God inside that rapture of being alive. So did Margaret. Somehow they find a, found a way to experience the connection between their innermost being in love and devotion to God and their physical bodies in movement. They discovered the possibility of experiencing a kind of unity within the experience of being alive in dance, a oneness, if you will, that is profoundly spiritual. <laughs> I've been practicing sacred and liturgical dance in churches since those early days of the 1980s. And one thing I've learned over the years is that you don't have to be part of a sacred dance group to experience this oneness that I'm talking about. Here's what I mean. I've been leading dance in this one church for maybe five or six years, quite regularly. One Sunday, an older woman, now I'm an older woman, but at the time I was in my 40s, and she was maybe my age. She came up to me at the end of worship. Our large intergenerational group had just moved together to the singing of the Lord's Prayer. This woman stood before me with tears just flowing down her face. She herself was a preacher's kid. So she had a long journey in the church. And she said to me in a kind of confession, I think, oh, Bunny, I have really not liked this dance business that you've been doing. I've opposed it all along. But I must tell you that today I understood it. Thank you. I think she experienced that oneness. She let herself feel with the dancers, and it changed her. When in your journey have you felt what Campbell calls the rapture of being alive? 
So many possibilities in the journey, right? For feeling the rapture of being alive. If we shared with one another and gathered all those stories together, what would we learn? Meanwhile, meanwhile, by loss, shall we dance? Amen.